While you were sleeping, shattered glass, walk the line, the pursuit of happiness, 310 to Yuma, W, Night and Day. These are just a few of the films that grace the resume of cinematographer Fedden Papa Michael. And this past year might have brought Mr. Papa Michael his greatest successes yet, having lensed Alexander Payne's The Descendants and George Clooney's The Ides of March. Mr. Papa Michael already has Judd Apatow's next film, titled This is 40, in the can, and he's about to embark on another collaboration with Mr. Payne titled Nebraska, his first film shot in black and white. Do you sense a kind of a feeling of community among other DPs? Yeah, there's a great sense of community. Um, I think more so than the, than other branches. And I mean, editors are very isolated. I mean, we we all like each other. We follow each other's work, and I think we always enjoy when we get together, which is not very often since you know there's only one DP on the set. Um, so it's, it's it's rare that we actually get together, but when when we have uh, those occasions, it's it's a lot of fun, and there's a great sense of, especially internationally, um, the American cinematographers when they get an opportunity to meet, you know, some of the smaller countries, or I mean, it's just um, you know they really respect the other filmmakers yeah. and are really interested in um, you know what's smaller, independent, and just different ways of working and. Um, but they really are very passionate about, uh, you know, seeing other other cinematographers' work that, that come from less exposed countries. And well, this is interesting to me. I, I mean, when you speak to colleagues, do you speak about, uh, I don't know, how, how did you achieve this, or what was it like to work under this particular director or under these conditions? Or yeah, there's a lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Um, you know, me being, uh, although I'm European. At birth, and you know, I've spent a lot of time here and grew up here. I came to America when I was, you know, 22. I've, I've pretty much exclusively worked um, in the States, and I'm considered, I guess, I'm a, primarily an American cinematographer. Although I have done some independent European films, um, and I've shot in Greece, and I've shot in Yugoslav, former Yugoslavia and Montenegro, and uh, in the Balkans in general, and I. I I shoot commercials here, and I direct commercials here, and shoot them as well. Um, so I, I have a pretty good insight on, on, you know, both ways of working. And so I mean, there's a lot of the questions to towards the Americans are often, you know, just they're, they're not, they have no uh, concept of, you know, budgets, you know, of, you know mm-hmm. beyond a hundred million, or let's say even beyond, you know, ten million. Sort of what is the difference and. Um, no, but but it's always interesting. It's always nice to tell them that you know the bottom line is we're still, you know, we got to tell a story and we're, you know, what what actually the art of cinematography and what gets captured in the end is is always still uh, a small intimate affair and and you, you you know the artistry always stays. I mean it, it, the scale of the production and all the equipment grows, but in the end it's it's very similar. It doesn't really matter what the budget is and you know you're always rushing no matter how much time you have and there's somebody always saying <laughs> spending too much money whether it's a three hundred million dollar movie or a three million dollar movie mm-hmm. or a three hundred thousand dollar movie. I mean I just directed a a two hundred thousand dollar movie and you know it's it was very similar. So the dynamics on set are not you know, the night and day, the the hundred ten million dollar movie I made. So Well with 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 your directing work I mean, was that? Did you feel that that was a natural progression from where you had started as a camera? No, it's not a progression, really. I mean, because I, I, I did it when I was kind of young. I did I, I directed my first feature when I was twenty nine, and I sort of fell into that. Uh, they wanted me to shoot a movie back then. It was a company called Motion Picture Corp of America. It was sort of people that used to work for Roger Corman, which is where I started. Mm-hmm. So, and. Uh, they probably thought I wouldn't be interested, so they said, "Well, if you shoot this for us, you'll get to direct this thing." I'm like, "Sure." <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll do that. Then, you know, so I ended up doing this movie called Sketch Artist, which was with Jeff Fay and Sean Young and Drew Barrymore back then. She was like 16, and I just done Poison Ivy, so I got her to be in my movie for like eight thousand dollars, which was mm-hmm. great. <laughs> um, so it, it, it kind of started like that, and then I did another movie called Dark Side of Genius. I had to direct it. Uh, and that was like a eight to fifteen 
day shoot, and I decided to try directing and shooting at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of um, an experiment. Didn't really enjoy that so much. And uh, and then you know I didn't do it for. Then my career sort of took off as a DP, and I started doing, you know, studio pictures because Cool Runnings was, a, you know, that was my first studio picture. That was a success. And then with that director, John Turtletop, I ended up doing four movies. So we did While You Were Sleeping, and then we did Phenomenon. So um, so I, I, I didn't direct for like 17 years or something. And I went back to it uh, after 310 to Yuma, and partially because... Um, Free Tent to Yuma was such a hard shoot, just the conditions and the winter, and then it was like our third same picture was mangled. Um, I just felt like I want to get away and do something smaller and less stressful and more intimate. And mm -hmm. I had a little script that I had developed with a friend of mine who actually used to be my dolly grip, and uh, we shot it in Greece, and that's was a picture called Arcadia Lost, and mm -hmm. I was actually able to get Nick Nolte to be in it, and, you know, we shot it all around my little village here in Greece in the Peloponnese, so... Um, so, d in that case, it felt... That was more sort of an experience, and also doing a movie back home, and um, and really trying to keep it small and simple, because the logistics of the Western, and, you know, the stunts, and the horses, and, <laughs> you know, it was it just um, sort of, you know, maybe... I can say it burned me out a little bit, so I just wanted to do something on a much more intimate scale. Yeah, but but then, if I'm not mistaken, you went directly to an even bigger production yeah. with Night and Day. And then I went. <laughs> I think then I went straight to another Mango movie, Night and Day. So, but I had I had my little getaway moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I could recover a little bit, and then, and then you know, I mean, in general, I mean, I think if you look at my films, I'm, I'm kind of. I, mean, I can't really be in hold. I mean, I'm all over the place, and, mm -hmm. and I do, but I do enjoy doing the smaller movies. And you know, whether I mean, they're technically not independent because I guess even Alexander Payne's movies are Fox Searchlight movies. I guess Fox movies, but um, but you know, they're much smaller budget, and and Sideways was you know 40 million, and Descendants was, I think pretty much the same. I mean, they're mm -hmm. just on a much smaller scale. I do enjoy doing those a lot more than the big spectacles. And, well, and it was a very nice uh, uh, project to go to after night and day because, you know, that took eight months and we were you know, three different, well, two different continents, but I don't know, five, six different countries. And it's such a puzzle when you do a big action movie like that because you're shooting pieces and you know, that you connect to other pieces you shoot months later, and then you never really get a sense of the story. Mm -hmm. And even when you see the results cut together, you like it kind of surprises you that you actually did those things because <laughs> it, it often yeah. comes back to you so much later. So it was, it was a great, um, you know, uh, uh, direction to take and to go into Descendants, which was just wonderful, again, basically recreating, you know, the amazing set and amazing feel of, uh, collaboration we had on Sideways, and mm -hmm. I I always thought that that could really that was a very unique situation and couldn't be reproduced. But in the end, uh, Alexander managed really to. I mean, we brought a lot of the same people back, and uh, a lot of my crew came back, and everybody wants to work for Alexander. So um, it was very very similar. Again, I mean, beautiful location, of course, but also. Um, just a, a very respectful, creative, uh, small set, and I, this time I guess with a bigger movie star, I, I was thought one of the reasons Sideways was so enjoyable but it was because we didn't have the movie star as per se, because I guess Paul Giamatti wasn't uh, really that you know well known at the time, and Thomas Hayden Church and mm -hmm. Virginia Madsen. I mean, they all got a lot of notice from that movie, but. But, you know, Clooney was, you know, not a typical, he he was, he's just an ultimate professional, and he's, he fit right in and just liked to be very relaxed and have fun. And You really don't have a clue, do you? Dad, 
time mom was cheating on you. That is what we fought about. When I was home at Christmas, I caught her with a guy. It made me sick to see her near you. I went back to school thinking that that was it, that I was just done with her. I was going to call and tell you everything. And, and then the accident happened, and I was waiting until she woke up again. You didn't even suspect, right? Right? You disgusted me, too. You're always so busy. Caught her with a guy. What does that mean? I was on my way to swim in the Black Point Pool with Brandy, and suddenly I see Mom and some douchebag walking into a house. His house, I guess. There's some guy. It could be anybody. And he had his hand on her ass. It was gross. And you worked with him again in in Ides of March. Yeah, and then I, I, you know, I think, I think he liked the way we worked on the set. And, you know, we don't do. It's not a very technical set. It's, it's pretty, you know, we pretty efficient. We don't do a lot of takes. Uh, it's not like we shot list a lot of things. We just watch the blocking, we look at a rehearsal, and then Alexander and I just discuss the the shots briefly. It's pretty much sort of unfolds naturally the way we're going to cover the scene mm -hmm. and react to what's happening. And I think George Clooney reacted to to that whole vibe on the set very positively. And that's during the movie, actually, at the halfway part, he asked me to, to shoot Hyde. So uh, mm. I think he just liked, um, liked the simplicity of our set. And as I went on to discover, I mean, he works even more <laughs> economical and even quicker than Alexander. I mean, mm. we were always saying, well, Alexander only does, like, you know, three to five takes, but George literally, he does one or two <laughs> takes if he can. If he can, he'll do one. I'll go, shouldn't we do another one? He's like, why? <laughs> Says we're going to help people get an education, we're going to create national unity, we're going to teach young people a trade, and we're going to get them out of debt for their college loans. Now, where does that fail? Oh, that's exactly right, Governor. It's just, if you're going to do it, do it. Make it mandatory, not voluntary. Uh, that'll pull well. Mandatory. Everybody who turns 18 or graduates high school gives two years of service to his or her country. And for that, your college education is paid for, period. Paul likes this. Mm -hmm. The beauty of it is that everybody who's over the age of 18 or past the age of eligibility will be for it. Why not? And all of the others... You can't vote. Too young. One thing that you reminded me of is I, I heard an interview with Spielberg where <clears throat> they were asking him how he chooses where to place the camera. And and he kind of echoed what, something that you just said about watching them rehearse or blocking the scene. And you put the camera where your eye naturally goes in the scene. I mean, do, do, do you feel that way or...? Yeah, you can. I mean, we kind of work that way. I mean, I work that way with James Mangle. Again, like with uh, a Walker line or a three time, we don't really sit down and shot list and uh, storyboard. Mm -hmm. uh, we we like to see what's happening that very last moment when you have all the elements together. The actors are there. It's actually the set is fully dressed. Uh, you see what the light is doing and you see how they want to move and you get a sense of. The drama of the scene is it you know is it playing more dramatic than you've imagined it? Is it playing more static? Is it, it does it need more energy? And and it's also nice uh, to be able to react to to those things that happen really very much in the end. I mean even even in a rehearsal it won't really happen. And 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 it's nice almost to react to like the first take. Sometimes we just start shooting although we haven't really figured out exactly what the first shot is. But you get, you know, then you, they really bring it, and you really get a sense of what the scene is, and and then you know we adjust the coverage for that, and sometimes we'll we'll discover that we can eliminate some shots, or we can it sort of plays, and you know because they are moving a certain way, if we move the camera a little bit this way, you know, we can eliminate some coverage that way, and mm -hmm. it becomes a more organic sort of interaction, and that's my favorite way of doing it. Now, of course, Spielberg actually 
far as I know, doesn't really work that way. I mean, I've been on the set, but you know, it was Jurassic Park. So, but he's very much off of storyboards, and it seems like he's it's very precise in terms of he'll only shoot what he needs. Um, uh, just because I, you know, I saw him do one take, and then he wanted to move on, and they told him like something wasn't good, and he goes, "In what section of a shot wasn't it good?" And they said, "Well, like here." And the, he goes, "Okay, I only need it for this section, so we're moving on." <laughs> so, I mean, it, it seems like he's, uh, you know, very much in the know of what he needs. But um, but we like the you know the more organic way of working, and and I've worked with other directors, Gore Vabinsky. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, very different school. It comes from commercials. It comes from storyboards. When you have every frame up on a board on the set, and you cross them out as you do them, and you know, he'll come to set with let's say 24 frames, and we're going to do exactly those 24 frames. You know, mm-hmm. and it's a really designed picture. And then you know, his his movies. I mean, not just the ones I did with him. I did Mouse Hunt, his first picture, and Weatherman. Um, but, you know, they're very precisely crafted. And then, you know, those actors are, you know, sort of forced into the design of that. Uh, they have to conform to what that idea is. And some actors are very good at it. Um, Diane Keaton that I did Unstrung Heroes with was very much like that. She, you know, has very high aesthetics and very strong visual sense. And she had designed uh, that film also very precisely prior to shooting, I mean, where she would go to the set and uh, actually pre-shoot everything with a video camera and then uh, edit it and score it and, and give me the, the, the tapes to, to look at in pre-production. And, and she was acting out the, all the parts of all the actors. So, you know, when we when we actually shot it, it was really just sort of, it's much more like the Hitchcockian way of doing it, like recreating all the, the design of I mean, you're just recreating her shots, and uh, of course, it's not always possible, and it's not always the same. But but some actors, you know, like it, some don't. I mean, Nicolas Cage and Weatherman, he he had no problem. You would tell him, here's your number one, here's your number two. <laughs> he can walk from here to here, say those lines, and he was happy to do it. It is very, it is very unique in that, I mean, a- a- acting can be such a technical as well as an emotional exercise but I, I would imagine it's the same for everyone on the set telling the story well like I said I mean some actors have no problem dealing with the technical aspects and, and are able to execute all the mechanics uh, mm-hmm. and not get in the way of their emotions but um, you know others had I mean I know John Turturro wanted definitely more freedom and I remember um, Jenna Rollins, when she worked with Woody Allen on Another Woman, uh, you know, she came from the Cassavetti School where, you know, basically the camera is a slave to the actor. The actor can go and do whatever he wants. Right. And the camera has to be completely reactive. <clears throat> and then, you know, with Woody, Woody, it's complete the opposite. I mean, it's very designed, and that's why Dan Keaton was very strongly influenced by him. So, you know, Woody would tell her, you know, here on this line, I need you to get up and take this glass and set it down over here, and then that will take the camera to here. And you know, he creates these sort of wonders. And uh, that's actually I my favorite had, Woody Allen had, movie. She had problems too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of. She asked for different versions, and then you know, he would do them, but then he would, <laughs> uh, you know, not <laughs> use them. <laughs> I, I, I another question for you: when you when you're in preparation for for a film. Any film, but uh, I mean, take the Ides of March for instance. Do you do you reference other works, say the political thrillers from the seventies for the Ides of March? Yes, or? yeah, we did. Um, again, uh, with with George, we didn't do a lot of prep, but we talked about some movies. I mean, he recommended some movies I should look at. Um, um, watched uh, The Candidate and, you know, All the President's Man and, you know, ju- in general, sort of films from the 70s because I, I could feel that that was the aesthetic he wanted for that film. So I also watched on my own epic movies uh, like The Conversation and mm. um, Three Days of a Condor, for example. Um, and uh, and then I made my notes with the script and, and then did sort of... Um, 
a run through with him where I went through it and suggested things the way I saw him and uh you know I was talking with the production designer a lot uh in terms of you know the color palettes and and uh setting a tone for the film and obviously a lot was dictated. I mean we're on the east coast in the winter so we're in cities like Cincinnati and Detroit so it was pretty um much dictated to us what the feel would be but um again with George not really shot listing not really talking specifics uh, in the eyes I guess just the opening sequence when Ryan Gosling comes out and tests the mic and the stage mm -hmm. uh, we we talked a little more specifically about um, what kind of shots we want to see there and the same for the ending when he walks through the tunnel and walks to the to his final interview I mean those things were a little more designed but again very similar to Alexander or Mangold where we often would just watch and block and rehearse the scene and then uh, when we send the actors off for final touches or makeup and hair and we just we just you know scribble down what shots we're going to do and it's again like not like we don't cover a lot it's pretty precise mostly single camera coverage so mm. it's not a lot of uh a uh, random fishing with multiple cameras it's 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 very much a traditional classic way of shooting things and um and, and with George like i said it was even much more economical than on Alexander's set in some days we would have a 7 a.m. call and we ended up you know rehearsing a scene and i'd set it up and uh, uh you know we 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 shoot seven shots and then by by lunch we'd be done Wow, <laughs> I mean, it would happen quite often that you know the first AD was having the problem. Okay, now now what do we do? Where do we go? I mean, we can't really pull this location up because everything was on location, so it's not like on stage. Okay, well we'll just go to this scene. It's like, well, we can't go there. <laughs> we can't go. Well, I guess uh, we'll have lunch and it's a wrap. <laughs> so, That's a great way to work. <laughs> yeah, and it's great. And it's you know he likes. I mean, he doesn't like to work people hard. It's very. Uh, Clooney really likes everybody to be happy and everybody to be relaxed, and he doesn't like a lot of pressure. And you know, he also doesn't want to work that hard himself. And I think it comes, you know, when you're an actor, and sometimes I think you're just traumatized because sometimes you end up on sets where, and you know it, like when you're as, as experienced as, as Clooney. I mean, you've, you know, when when someone is making you do 15 to 35 takes, or I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard stories of more. Uh, prior to that, I did, did some reshoots on a Jim Burke movie. I did How Do You Know reshoots. and mm -hmm. you know, It's just the opposite. I mean, we just do take after take after take. And I think at one point, you know, people just start losing their, yeah. their direction. They don't really know what we're trying to find. <laughs> but I would think that shooting quickly, uh, that... Uh, as you've been describing, that the, the Corman was like an ideal training ground to learn that discipline. Well, for me, it's perfect. And, I mean, I don't know. We always say we're not that good, but we're fast and cheap. And and that's definitely, I mean, because a lot of my crew actually goes back to the Corman days. And um, I'm sure a lot of my crew back then, I mean, they were AFI students, like, and now they're all Academy Award winning cinematographers. Mm. Wally Pfister was. Uh, my operator and Janusz Kaminski was my gaffer. Wow. Wally uh, and Mauro Fiore, <coughs> who won for Avatar, was my dolly grip and key grip for a whole bunch of pictures. And uh, you know, then I let uh, Janusz shot some second unit for me and the Corman movies and the Wally. And uh, so we all go way back. But yeah, that was the best training ground because um, Roger didn't really care what we did stylistically. And that's why it was a lot of fun because we could be very experimental. It right. wasn't like we started in television that had a certain look. We had to, you know, a certain conservatism. I mean, back then television was very conservative. I mean, now it's, you know, really come a long way. But uh, we could do whatever we wanted as long as we, you know, shot it on time. I mean, we had 15 days for a feature, mm -hmm. um, three five-day weeks basically, and. You know, we were young. It was all a lot of handheld, 18-hour uh, days. Everybody pretty much got $100 a day, and 
uh, as long as we covered, you know, the nudity and the violence that was required. He didn't care if it was all golden and smoked up. And we would see movies like The Last Emperor, and we'd go back, and I was, I remember, I was doing Strip to Kill 2 or something, and, uh, you know, we'd pushed all this golden light through, and, and it looked like the light. And I told my my, 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 my timer that, at the lab back then, you know, make it look like Last Emperor and stuff. But, but we could, <laughs> we could really play with a lot of things, and we had a lot of freedom. We could be very dark, very moody, very expressionistic with the colors, and uh, and we had to be fast. We had to yeah. be super fast. So, well, well, W was another fast production, wasn't it? Yeah, that was. Uh, I think it was uh, 38 days. Wow. A lot of locations, all locations again. Very fast, yeah. Mm. Yeah, he does and, shoot and quickly. and and Oliver, <clears throat> you know, very demanding, obviously. And um, um, but again, um, pretty much knows what he wants and not over covering things. You want to know what I see, Mr. President? I see a world where, in about twenty-five years, America's reserves are gone, done. Demand is up thirty, forty percent. And we have two oceans blocking us from the world reserves. You think we're going to have allies then? We're at 5% of the world's population. We use 25% of its energy. You think Russia and China are going to help us out when they need those resources themselves? 80% of the world's future energy reserves are right here in Eurasia where the prize ultimately lies. Oil, gas, water. Iraq alone, 10% of the world's reserves. 60 of 80 oil fields are still undeveloped. And probably another 100 billion gallons in their western desert. They're floating in a sea of oil. We have bases in more than 120 countries all over the world. We include Iraq, look what happens. We are at the fertile choke point of civilization. The Tigris Euphrates is the biblical cradle. We drain the swamp, like Don says. We rebuild it. We develop its resources to the maximum. They own it. We run it. Pipelines, sea land, their resources finance the reconstruction. Nexus of power that won't be broken in our lifetime. If we stick to the plan. So what is our real exit strategy on a rat dick? There is no exit. We stay. See, it's it's nice to keep a momentum. You don't want to. It's nice when you have a certain pace on the set. I mean, I I really don't enjoy uh, overscheduled movies. I, I I think if you don't have to, uh, I mean, if you don't have to rush a little bit, I think. You know, it becomes what I call decadent filmmaking. I mean, I've, I've been on sets where it's just like it's too much time and too big mm. of a production, and, and you just feel like you can't react to things and you can't move, and I feel you lose a lot of the creativity that way. And um, it's just, uh, you know, when they say, when I go, can can we get the actor? Like, look at the look what's happening. The light is, and they, can we try to get the actor here now? And well, no, you know, this week is really not scheduled. I, tired and you know we can finish it tomorrow i'm like well, dude, I, I don't want to finish it tomorrow you know i want to finish it now but but you know that's what's so great when you're i mean the you know extreme being you know the two hundred thousand dollar movie i just did uh it's just like you can you know you're running around with a 5d or a red and or a Lexus, and you're not lighting things and you're shooting on the street without lights and you can go any direction you want and whenever you see something you can react to it you can trying to incorporate it whenever, you know, something's happening with the clouds or with the light, then you can mm -hmm. say, can we just go outside and do this scene now, and like, can we just change your T-shirt, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> not dealing with wardrobe department, and makeup, and hair, and continuity, and, you know, trailers, and parking, and, I mean, all that stuff is just like a big ball on your leg, and it's, I mean, that's why it's so great to see, you know, smaller countries like Iran, and, um, Romania and all these 
country is making really interesting films now. And, yeah. And I always tell them, you guys don't know like what a great advantage you have. You know, I mean, you always envy us, and you want the big budgets, and you know, obviously they want to make more money. Um, but you know, from a creative standpoint, they have a great advantage often. Right. You know, I'm I'm curious, looking over your films, because um, with most disciplines I, I speak to, whether it's the editor or the composer or the actor, they all say that, that comedy is very tricky. So, I mean, you've shot comedy. You just shot the the latest Judd Apatow. Yeah. Uh, is, that, is it tricky to shoot comedy over drama? Well, um... I mean, Judd Apatow is the master of being free and capturing things. Uh, it's 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 probably the I, I never would have expected it going into it. I thought, oh, this might not be so interesting for me visually. But he actually really requires a lot of freedom for his actors on set, especially uh, since his kids were both, you know, had had much bigger involvement in, in this movie. Mm-hmm. This is forty. And um, his wife, and really try to sort of get the, the momentum going, and get these, you know, the, the, the younger daughter who's eight, and really, uh, you know, you need to keep the energy up on the set, and you can't have technicalities and the mechanics of making a movie get in the way. So it became like the closest thing I've experienced to like a Cassavetti set, where I had multiple cameras, at least two sometimes three and four, most of them handheld, really just reacting and not designing shots at all. I mean, talk about never talking about shots or any kind of design to the picture. Um, so that's, that becomes a whole different challenge, and I, I do think it really works well for comedy. And, uh, you know, I've done work with Robin Williams where, you know, we just roll and roll and roll. And back then it was film. I mean, Judd Apatow, I shot digitally. So we had uh, three Alexas. And, you know, that, that's another big advantage. You know, you can do very long takes. You can series things. You never really have to cut. You never have to reset. I mean, we would reset while we roll. And, um, you know, we would roll very often, at least 20 minutes at a time. Mm. And, uh, um I know Janusz, when he did Funny People, they actually made special mags, 2,000-foot mags, so they can roll 20 minutes. On, um, but uh, a lot of freedom for the actors. And, and and the same goes for lighting. I mean, you really have to light the set <clears throat> and keep it keep the floor clear of equipment, you know, so they can go places. Right. So um, very natural light, which I always prefer if I can. Uh, anyway, and um, and just you know, you, you take some risk. You let you know. Sometimes people aren't in the in the perfect, perfectly lit environment, but but it's something you have to learn to embrace and and, and like actually. Well, really, I I, I would think um, I read an interview with someone a couple of weeks ago. I think it was Christopher Doyle, oh, yeah. um, and he was talking about m- more than. Any other consideration, he thinks that location is almost the most important thing yeah, to consider. I agree. I have to agree. I mean, I would say cinematography is at least 50, if not more, percent uh, of what's actually what you're photographing. Mm. Uh, there's a reason, like, you know, Petrolucci movie shot in Toscana, you know, 1900, and, uh, you know, why. Uh, uh, you know, going from Mista and why those movies look incredible, or you know, last time in Paris shot in Paris. I mean, you know, there's this. Like also, you know, there's a reason. You know, Brad Pitt movie shot in Montana. <laughs> you win Academy Award. <laughs> um, so it's very important what's actually in front of your lens. Um, and if everything is right and it looks good, ideally you don't have to. Uh, you know, you can only mess it up by by overlighting it or. Uh, if something is right, it, it requires very little, very simple lighting. When I struggle lighting-wise, I know there's some element in the shot that is not working. Right. Whether it's uh, a wall that's the wrong color, or somebody is walking in with the wrong sweater, or some, there's some cacophony of 
something happening and and I'm having a hard time lighting it. If if if, if the set is great and the actors are dressed right and you know look good, which usually they do, then uh, you should have to do very little. Mm-hmm. Is there something that you uh, long to do, whether it be a particular genre or? Well, um, luckily I got to do a western. Mm-hmm. Um, I always enjoy period pieces. I would, I would wouldn't mind doing more. I've never really done sort of a 19th century piece, or um, wouldn't mind doing that. But of course, black and white, which uh, um, looks like our next film with Alexander Payne is going to be a black and white film. We finally. Uh, Convinced the studio we won the battle. Oh wow! Is that Nebraska? Is that the one? Yeah, Nebraska oh, wow. will be in black and white, at least for most markets. <laughs> um, but it, it actually went away because we insisted on black and white, and then we lost our funding. It was going to go last fall, and um, now they've come back. I mean, I'm sure partially due to the success of Descendants. Mm-hmm. But uh, so now we got our will. So we're going to do. Uh, a black and white road movie that goes from Montana to Nebraska. It's a very simple, intimate story. Again, it's a father and son traveling, sort of their last journey and discovering each other's past. And wow, um, it's, it's very. I'm very excited about that. Do, do you are you excited by the prospect of 3D since that's a that's a big trend now? Uh, you know what? I haven't really. Um, I must say. You know, other than, I mean, the only 3D film I saw, and my friend shot it, and he had come back from New Zealand and he said that was the worst experience of my mm. life. <laughs> and it's really not worth it. I'm sure he felt differently after he won the Academy Award, was Morrow. Uh, and so I did go, obviously, and see Avatar. And I must say, I was, uh, you know, I was very much impressed when I saw those images up. Uh, but, um, Personally, I'm not. It's not the kind of filmmaking I'm. I like the kind of stories I like to tell, and, and like I said, it goes back to everything I said. Just the more simple character pieces, and mm-hmm. I don't think 3D is really helpful or required for those. Right. So, I'm not ex- too anxious to. I'm. I'm not going to say I'll never have to uh, figure out how to do it. I mean, I know. Or my colleague Darius Wolski has uh, probably wasn't too excited about doing it either, but has done Alice in Wonderland and The Last Pirates, and I think he just did uh, Ridley Scott Aliens in 3D. And so um, I don't. Uh, I'm not saying I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have to do it. Well, it all all depends not, on the material. I'm not. I'm not you know, I, I don't consider myself really uh, too technical as a cameraman. Mm-hmm. And I only learned. I mean, I'm I'm very comfortable with digital cameras now, mm-hmm. especially with the addition of the Alexa. Um, I actually like it a lot, and um, I, I I tend to continue using it. Um, but uh, I usually just deal with a new technology when I have to. Right. Um, and um, I don't go out and explore all these technologies. I mean, unless I'm specifically confronted with having to use something. And then I'll test it myself. Uh, I always have to test it myself and, you know, decide what kind of test it is. And I, I, I can't just, you know, yeah. So it's, it's usually pretty complex tests. And um, I project them uh, on a big screen and really take them all the way through the post. So. Yeah, well, I I'm, I'm crazy about the movies that you do, and and uh, I mean I, I congratulate you particularly on the Ides of March and the Descendants this year. That, Thank that's you so a, much. That's a great year. <laughs> that's yeah, that's a, that's it's great to have two good. I mean, you know, we all just want to do good movies, and uh, like I said somewhere, I mean, I, I I if somebody comes to me and goes, oh, that was a great looking movie, I, I really don't feel that as a compliment. I. I I'd much rather work on a good movie than a good-looking movie. And usually, I think if somebody says that was a good-looking movie, I feel like I failed to do my job because they became conscious of it. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I'd rather have nobody notice what I do and then just you know enjoy the film. And- That's it for this episode of our Art of Cinematography series. 
You can listen in on additional episodes and interviews with many of today's top cinematographers, including Robert Richardson, Vilmos Zygmunt, Alan Davia, Paul Cameron, Jeff Cronenwitz, and more, by visiting moviegeeksunited.net slash art of cinematography.